So today I want to talk to you about uh, data rejection and weighted averages, chapters 6 and 7 in your text. So first of all, you should understand that rejection of data is a somewhat controversial issue, um, so you have to be really careful. If there's a valid reason that you know that the data is bad, then you can reject it just straight off. For example, if you didn't calibrate your device or your device malfunctions in some way during the acquisition, something like that, then you can reject the data. So when I say data rejection for the rest of this talk, what I mean is you have collected this set of data and you have an outlier point that is messing up the value that you want to report. For example, you know, if you have one or two outliers very far away from your mean, then um, the tendency for students is to want to get rid of that data point. And so everything I'm going to say from here on out addresses that concern. If you don't know that anything in particular is wrong, if you were taking data, you took a bunch of data, this data point shouldn't be any different than any of the rest of the data points, then that's the kind of data rejection that I'm talking about here. This contrasts with if something goes wrong during your setup, somebody sneezed while you were trying to take that data point and mess everything up, then you can just reject that data point because you know what went wrong with it and everything is, is, is good. So this is just for, uh, for outlying data points where there's no real reason that anything should be wrong with it. Okay, so like I said, this is a sort of a moral question for scientists. And some scientists think that you should never reject data like that. Of course, they still believe that you can reject data if you know that you did something wrong. But they don't feel that it's right to reject data if it's data that should be fine. So what I'm going to teach here is one viewpoint or guideline that is somewhat controversial, and it's called Chauvinet's Criterion for Data Rejection. I'm not advocating that you reject any data, okay? Um, and also, if you do decide to use this or any other criterion for data rejection, then when you uh, report your data, you should describe what you did to your data in that report, okay? You, you need to say, I used Chauvinet's Criterion for Data Rejection, whatever okay, in your report if that's what you decide to do. It's very important to be honest about that kind of thing. All right, so disclaimers aside, here's the way to use Chauvinet's criteria for data rejection. So first of all, let's say that you've taken n measurements, all of the same quantity, and you've calculated your mean and your standard deviation, as we discussed in a previous lecture, from all of the data points. And this is all the data points without getting rid of any first. Okay, including the bad or suspect data point. So now you look at your suspect data point and you calculate your T value for that. So that's the absolute value of your suspect data point minus your mean, okay, and then divide that by your standard deviation. And that will tell you how many standard deviations from the mean this is from your average. Okay? Now you want to find the probability that the data point might lie that far away from the mean. And so to do that, you can use your tables, like we discussed last time. So to do that, the probability that it's outside T sigma is going to be 1 minus the probability that it's inside T sigma, and you read that probability from your tables. So you find that probability, that probability that it's outside T sigma, and then you calculate the number of data points in your sample set that you would expect to be that far away given a normal distribution of data. So we're going to call that number little n, and it's big N, the total number of data points that you have, times the probability that you just found that it's outside T sigma. Okay. Then if little n is less than one half, then you can reject that data point. In other words, if it doesn't round up to one, that you should have at least one data point that's that far away, then you can reject. Okay, like I said, this means that if your data follows a normal distribution, okay, and your sample size is big N, you would not expect to find at least one data point that far from the mean, and so you can reject it. You should never reject more than one or possibly two data points based on this criterion because it's dishonest, okay? If you have that many outliers, then something else is wrong. You took your data incorrectly, you need to repeat your experiment, there's something that you've forgotten to account for, you have some sort of systematic uncertainty, something like that. Also, if you don't expect your data to obey a Gaussian distribution, then you should not use this criterion. 
For example, if you're doing some kind of experiment on radioactive decay, okay, then that's not going to obey a Gaussian or normal distribution, and so you shouldn't use Chauvenet's criterion. You should also know that some scientists disagree with this criterion, and they think that n less than one half is sort of an arbitrary cutoff, that it might be too big or too small or whatever. Okay, so this is, like I said, somewhat controversial. Okay, so here's an example of Chauvenet's criterion. Um, let's say that, and this is data that I took from a real 4210 experiment, senior seminar, uh, where they were measuring the speed of light C. And they found uh, 10 different measurements for C, and here they, here they are, all times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And then using the criterion, can they reject the outlying value, 3.824 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, as detailed here. Okay, so first of all, they found their mean, uh, and you just added up all those values and divided by 10 to find the mean, and that's 3.08 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And then they found the standard deviation, just like you would find the standard deviation as I, out, uh, as I outlined in a lecture a couple weeks ago. And so they found those values. It was 3.08 plus or minus 0.35 times 10 to the 8th meters per second for the value in its standard deviation. Okay, now I kept a few more digits in T um, to uh, reduce rounding error. When you report it, though, remember you only keep one at most two sig figs in your uncertainty um, and you round later. Okay, so here's T. I kept multiple digits. It's the 3.824 minus my mean, which is 3.081. Absolute value of that and then divided by my standard deviation. And I got T is equal to 2.16. Now you go to your um, tables, your normal integral tables that are in the appendix of your textbook, and you look at 2.16, so you go down to 2.1, there's 2.10, and you go over to 2.16, and it's 96.92. Now that's the probability that it lies within those values in the Gaussian, and then to find the probability that it's outside, it's 100% minus um, 96.92, and that gives you 3.08%, okay? So uh, the probability would be 0 0.0308, and you multiply that times the number of data points, which is 10, and you get 0 0.308. And 0 0.308 is less than one half, so that means that that data point can be rejected by Chauvenet's criterion. Um, if you then calculate your new mean and standard deviation without that data point based on not the nine remaining data points, then you get the new speed of light is 3 plus or minus 0.24 times 10 to the eighth meters per second which is much closer to the, the true speed of light. Okay, so that's how you use Chauvenet's criterion. It's really not terribly hard, but you just have to know when to apply it and when you can and can't use it. And remember, don't do this with more than one or two data points. Okay, the next topic that I wanted to cover was weighted averages. So you use this sometimes if you're taking a bunch of measurements of the same quantity, but those measurements all have very different uncertainties, okay? Then it's better to use a weighted average instead of the traditional definition of the average, where you just add the numbers up and divide by the number of uh, total measurements you took. So if you remember the definition of standard deviation, the standard deviation is the uncertainty on each particular value x sub i, right? And then if you think x bar is your mean or average, x sub i are the numbers that you added up to make your average, okay? Um, so that standard deviation is supposed to be the uncertainty on each data point used to calculate your average. So if your uncertainties are not close to your standard deviation and if they're not similar to one another, then, then that's not the best way to obtain your best value, okay? And the weighted averages would be the way to go. Okay, so here, let's just say that you're trying to calculate some weighted average of some quantity y, okay, uh, and you have uh, various values that you experimentally determined for y. So the values of y and its uncertainties I call here y um, plus or minus sigma uh, for the different values a, b, c, and d, or whatever. Okay, so here's how you calculate that. Here's the formula for your weighted average. It's just the sum of the weight for each measurement times the measurement. Okay, and then divided by the sum of the weights. Now what's a weight? Well, a weight is one over the square of your uncertainty. Okay, so um, it's defined there in terms of an equation on the slide. So that's how you find your weights, and the reported uncertainty on your weighted averages should then be one over the square root of the sum of the weights, as is shown in the equation here. 
Okay, so I think the best way to illustrate this is just an example. So here's one about students measuring um, g, little g, the acceleration due to gravity, and boom. The results um, and their uncertainties are displayed there below, and you can see that um, the uncertainties on these values are very different. They range from 1 all the way down to 0.02. So some of them have much larger uncertainties than others, okay? The idea in a weighted average is that you weight the um, measurements that have less uncertainty more strongly, okay? So the ones that you're more certain about, those get greater weights. Okay, now given the four measurements, what's our best estimate for G and its uncertainty? Well, here you go. I did this um, in an Excel file, which I'll then make available to you guys. Um, but the values for G are in the first column. Um, and then the uncertainties on G are reported next to their values in that second column. I then calculated the weights in the third column, and it's 1 over the square of the um, uncertainties. Okay? And then in the fourth column, what I did was I multiplied the values in the first column times the weights in the third column to obtain the fourth column. According to the formula, then, you then sum up the weight times the value, and I did that underneath um, right here. Okay, so I summed that up and then divided that by the sum of the weights, which is here, 2926. Okay, and that gave me my value of G. And you can see that my value of G is 9.79, which we would expect um, from the values and the uncertainties displayed on the previous slide. And then your uh, uncertainty in the weighted average is 1 over the square root of the sum of the weights. I calculated the sum of the weights in the bottom of that third column, and then I just did 1 over the square root of that sum. Um, right here where it says zig equals. Okay, so that's my uncertainty. So um, notice that Excel keeps lots of digits, but what you want to do is keep one uh, sig fig, you know, ideally one in your uncertainty. And then if you do that, then since my um, value for sigma is 0 0.0185, I would round it to 0 0.02. So my final reported value would be 9.79 plus or minus 0 0.02 meters per second squared when I reported my final value. So that's how to take weighted averages, and that's how to take um, uh, Chauvinet's, use Chauvinet's criterion for data rejection. All right, pretty simple one for this week. Not, uh, not too long of a lecture, nice, short, and sweet, and I'll see you in class.